Hi, my name's Rust. I'm a Soulsborne content creator with an emphasis on PvP. We all love a good true combo or a roll catch, but no one ever seems to talk about frame traps. A frame trap occurs when you force your opponent into a scenario where there is no way that they can escape the possibility of damage. If we compare this to a roll catch, a roll catch is the attempt to get damage on the opponent as they exit their roll. But if they time their roll well, then the roll catch won't be successful. So in more and more scenarios when facing more experienced opponents, roll catches become unreliable, and it becomes increasingly difficult to actually land a hit. So in this video, I'll be going over a number of different frame traps that you can set up and the conditions required to perform them. At the end of the video will be a showcase where I'll be demonstrating the concepts covered in the video. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe, and let me know in the comments if you found the information helpful at all, or if you're just more confused than ever. Now, frame traps are super specific, and in order to work, the math has to add up. If it doesn't, it's not a frame trap, it's a skill issue. Frame traps have to meet three specific conditions in order to be successful. Latency, timing, and range. Every, well, most frame traps have their flaws, and it largely depends on your spacing and positioning in order to make the frame trap successful. But any frame trap, as well as roll catches, suffer from the same flaw. Latency. At 160 milliseconds of latency at 30 FPS, it becomes impossible to roll catch if the opponent rolls twice in a row. This is due to an issue of overlapping iframes. When you attack your opponent, it has to be confirmed on both sides of the connection. If you go for an attack that looks like it should have landed on your screen, but they were in iframes on their screen, then the hit won't land. If you go for an attack and it looks like it missed on your screen, but it goes through their hitbox on their screen, then the hit still won't land. So when you start reaching higher levels of latency, there becomes fewer and fewer frames in between consecutive rolls where the opponent is actually able to be hit. So all of these frame traps are assuming that you have a reasonable connection to your opponent at under 100 milliseconds of latency. The timing of a frame trap is extremely precise, where two attacks have to land within 21 frames apart in order to be considered a frame trap. A roll has 16 iframes and 5 vulnerable frames, before the person rolling can do any other action. The iframes start immediately and they become vulnerable again as their foot touches the ground. If the two attacks fall short of 16 frames, then they can effectively roll in such a way that both attacks land within the time that they are rolling. If the attacks land further than 21 frames apart, then they can always roll the second hit as long as they've rolled the first one successfully. So a frame trap is most consistent when the two attacks are within 16 to 21 frames. If the opponent were to roll so early as to squeeze in the roll immediately after the first hitbox clears, then they can effectively escape a frame trap, but this generally requires the opponent to successfully input their dodge within the first six frames of the attack. With that being covered, we have to consider the average reaction time of a player to an opponent's attack. This becomes important for understanding how the frame trap is set up. The average reaction speed can be measured using the human benchmark test, which tests your ability to react to the color on a screen changing from red to green. This is slowed down substantially in Elden Ring, since a roll input is confirmed on the release of the button, not the start. The average speed of a person's reaction is about 200 milliseconds. In Elden Ring, this roughly translates to 6 to 7 frames at 30 FPS, which is the standard unit of measurement in the frame data tools. So, when fighting something like a thrusting sword, you have to first, notice that the player model is animating an attack, and second, react to that animation by inputting your dodge and releasing the button in time in order to successfully avoid the hit. In general, animations can be blended to disguise the startup of their animations all the way up until their 8th frame, at which point you have 6 frames in order to be able to react to the side of the animation and commit to a dodge. With my reaction speed, added on top of dodging on release, I'm getting hit by just about every single thing. This is to say that in order to escape a frame trap that exists between 16 to 21 frames, you have to commit to a roll before you have the time to appropriately react to it. The last condition that has to be met is range. Most frame traps have a weak spot, where they won't work if the opponent rolls in a specific direction. You can largely influence this by applying corner pressure, wedging them into a spot where their options for where they're able to maneuver are limited. This can be done pretty easily in a competitive map and in specific areas of the world like hallways or the edge of a cliff, but it's much harder to produce any amount of corner pressure in the public arena because, well, it's a circle. A fucking huge one at that. So, where you can't rely on corner pressure, you have to rely on your opponent making a mistake and rolling in the wrong direction. Almost all one- and two-handed small weapons have frame traps built into their moveset. In the case of something like curved swords, the first R1 has 14 startup frames and 18 frames until the second R1. If the opponent manages to roll the first hit, then the second hit is confirmed as long as they roll forward or to the side. 
These weapons really favor having your opponent locked up in a corner in order to confirm the frame trap. And if you land the second swing, then you have a mere 8 frames of recovery which is faster than any startup of any other weapon, allowing it to escape any potential counter-aggression. Additionally, as far as power stance weapons goes, power stance straight swords and curved swords also have frame traps built into their first two L1s, similar to their 200 counterparts. But power stance straight swords have the edge in this case, where they also have a frame trap on their running L1, whereas all the hits of the power stance curved swords all fall within 16 frames of each other, so they aren't a true frame trap. Unlike the other frame traps so far, this one only lands if the opponent rolls directly away from you. These are really important frame traps to be aware of, both if you're using the weapon or if you're fighting against them. As a general rule, don't roll in against small weapons and roll in or to the side of the running L1s. But now we get into the Ashes of War. First and foremost, Glintstone Phalanx. This Ash of War is borderline broken when used effectively. It can serve as a means to chip down your opponent, stop them from spamming spells, and stagger them with 100 poise damage for each projectile with four of them spawning at a time. They can effectively cover a wide range of intervals to secure a frame trap by controlling the rotation of your character, causing the projectiles to release in staggered intervals. If you can sweep your motion properly, then you can spread them out to a full breadth where they can't be rolled. They have less than perfect tracking, so if the opponent is sprinting to the side or at a great distance, then they'll just miss. So mixing them into a running attack from a halberd or heavy thrusting sword is an effective way to force a roll and confirm the frame trap. The more that you practice with this, the better you get. The important thing is to try and prevent them from all releasing at the same time, otherwise they're just much less effective. But it's arguably one of the most reliable means of guaranteed damage and frame traps in the game. But of course, we can't forget the dreaded Spinning Slash, which, since patch 1.10, has become problematic. Specifically on Nagakiba. Spin Slash is a frame trap that can pseudo combo into a second frame trap if the first one connects at point blank range. If frame traps between the first and second slash, or if they dodge the first, then the second is guaranteed to land if they roll in or to the side, and of course this true combos into the third hit. But specifically on Nagakiba, which benefits from its long range, it frame traps no matter which direction the opponent rolls from the first attack. It can be escaped if they manage to roll behind the attacker, or the hitbox tilts upwards, but it's just better to get the hell out of range. There's a number of other weapon arts that work to frame trap as well, a notable one being the Bloody Helis. If the first part lands, then the follow-up is a true combo, which is great, but if the first part misses and the opponent tries to react roll the follow-up, then it's a frame trap. It can only be escaped if the opponent rolls in and to the left, or if they manage to get behind you. Now, we have to talk about Ashes of War that have a single lingering hitbox, namely Storm Stomp and Flaming Strike. These hitboxes for these Ashes of War last longer than the 16 frames of a roll which is what makes them so effective. But what makes them different from other frame traps is that if you receive a phantom hit by rolling as late as possible, then the game registers that you've already been affected by the Ash of War, and coming out of your iframes won't cause it to affect you a second time. If you're on a land-based connection where you had 0 milliseconds of latency to your opponent, then I don't know if it would be possible to roll late enough to get phantom hit. So in theory, it exists as a frame trap only in that specific scenario. Now there's a whole bunch of frame traps that we could get into when it comes to spells, with the bare basics being Dragon Breath and Star Shower, which have staggered projectiles, great tracking, and insane coverage that pretty much guarantee that the opponent is going to be hit. But I'll be honest, I'm not the guy to cover those things. My time is spent predominantly on physical weapons, and I heavily disdain spellcasting. But I encourage you to explore these spells and see what you can come up with to make some creative frame traps. There's some very cool interactions with setting up Magic Glint Blades or Shard Spiral to create frame traps, and I recommend starting there. I had a lot of help with this video from my friend Barebones, who has their own YouTube channel where they make great content with tons of useful information and amazing gameplay. Please go check them out and support my friend. From this point in the video, I'll be showcasing a number of these different types of frame traps and how they can dramatically improve your gameplay if you use them effectively. Be sure to like and subscribe, and let's get into the fights. For the first fights, we're starting off with two-handed curved swords. These are a great weapon to showcase how small weapons can work effectively when you utilize their ability to frame trap and maintain aggression with little to no risk. So here we see my opponent quick step in, which I can get my backswing off for free, and they get locked into a backstab animation, so I can take a couple extra free swings without any risk. They quick step in again, but I disengage this time, look for a better opportunity. You don't have to take every opening that you see, sometimes it's better to just wait, see how they play, and go for a clean hit instead of risking when you don't have to. And at this point my opponent changes strategies, instead of spamming his quick step, they decide to spam parry instead. I have no intention to get myself parried, so I use my superior L2 button and finish the fight. Continuing on with Curved Sword, my next opponent is using Fist Weapons. 
It's really important to be running over 88 poise, otherwise you end up like this poor guy, getting bullied by incredibly fast small weapons with insane roll catch potential and frame traps built into their moveset. And we see at the end here that my opponent is really struggling to find his footing and starts rolling into our attacks. He panic rolls early on the first swing so the back swing does not catch, but the third swing does catch his second roll. But for the last of the fights with the curved sword, we get a great mirror. Now, I don't know who this player was, but they're super fun to fight and clearly had some experience with the weapon. But once again, not having the poise to tank the backswing really left them in a tough spot. But you'll notice that since they're rolling away instead of in, they're escaping the possibility of the frame trap. We dance a little and they take a bait, which we punish with a standing R1, followed with a running roll catch. But they do a great job of not panic rolling, which would open them up to getting backstabbed. They land a great turn and reinforcing me onto my back foot and resetting to neutral. I misjudged their HP though, and I thought that they were only one hit away from death, so I go for the trade, but they're still holding on. I'm definitely low enough that it's still anyone's game, and I have to respect how well they play. So when I close in, I bait out the attack and start forcing rolls. I use lightning bundles and blocking with my weapon to help disguise the animations of my R1, so it's more difficult for them to be able to react to it, and eventually it pays off as we finish the fight with a roll catch. But up next is the Glenstone Phalanx Showcase, and for these fights I paired it with my Heavy Thrusting Sword, since it has really good synergy with both the standing and running R2s. The Phalanx has a really long cast time, so you need to be careful about your positioning when you set it up. So my opponent jumps in and we're able to roll, and I go for the R2, since the Phalanx will protect me if they go for a follow-up swing. I set up another Phalanx while they do their flaming strike thing, and break a couple of my glint blades, and I go for the another R2, but they roll to the side of my attack so it doesn't land. We get a nice 180 jump over their head for some big damage, and it's clear that they're starting to get frustrated as they stop and stand put, so I finish the fight with a full combo from the Phalanx into their R2. Once again, we have another Great Sword Enjoyer, and as the fight kicks off, immediately they start panic rolling. Against Phalanx, you really don't want to be panic rolling because you're just setting yourself up to get roll caught, whereas strafing at a medium distance would be the better way to go. I give them a little emote to like relax a bit, genuinely as advice, and the Phalanx fires itself off. I set up another one, and they start back to rolling. So I start letting them out one at a time, see if I can roll catch with them. Reset after two fire, so I'm always prepared and position myself to get the R2 roll catch with the last blade of the Phalanx to secure the frame trap. I back off as they continue to swing on a hit stun, and I get a free Phalanx, line up a jump, and get the Phalanx into the full combo for the JR2. They continue to aggress, and I finish the fight with a trade into the running R2. My next opponent comes up with yet another great sword and yet another parry shield. I use the Phalanx to whiff punish their R1, which they panic roll and get caught by the following running R2. I set up another phalanx and try and position myself to get the neutral R2 frame trap, but they roll into a direction that escapes the combo so I don't get my damage. But I disengage and they give chase, so I jump toward them to see how they're going to respond and throw out a delayed jump attack, which they try and parry. I probably say this in about every video at this point, but please go check out my parry video if you want to learn how to parry more effectively. But now that my opponent is hanging by a thread, I can finish the fight by just letting the phalanx do its work with no risk to myself. And for the last of the Phalanx fights, we have, you guessed it, another Great Sword user. But let me be perfectly clear, I fucking love Great Swords. But we kick off the fight with a full combo of the Phalanx into the running R2. They roll out into an attack, which gives me an opening to set up another Phalanx, which they roll into and get roll caught by one of the Glint Blades. I reposition and roll their R2 and set up another Phalanx to try and set up my frame trap with a standing R2. But our latency is a little high, so I don't land the hit. I go for the same thing but this time I'm more successful as one of the glint blades secures the frame trap into the R2 follow-up. I really didn't expect them to mash out a hitstun here, so I get hit, but jump right back in to punish their piercing thing and finish the fight with a roll catch from my offhand weapon. But speaking of great swords, I start off the next fight with one of my own. But if you thought that I'd be showing you frame traps with a great sword, you'd be as disappointed as I am, because great swords don't have any frame traps in their innate moveset, unfortunately. But what they do very well is go back into your inventory so that you can swap over to your dummy busted OP broken Stormhawk axe, which you can use to frame trap if your opponent has the misfortune of rolling into it. 
But speaking of OP dummy busted broken, up next is straight swords. Straight swords are absolutely ridiculous, having poise breaks on every swing, frame traps on their standing and running, L1s, and absurd damage to top it off. My general advice for dealing with straight swords is don't get hit. <laughs> and the best way to do that is to A, avoid panic rolling, and B, don't roll in. This opponent was very late into me reaching 180 MS, but even with less than optimal connection, the backswing is still able to frame trap as he rolls in repeatedly. I get plucked by his running attack, and I take some time to swap out my talismans, looking for a better opening. I go in on the running attack and frame trap the backswing as he avoids the first hit, get a little poke, and finish the fight with a roll catch. If we're comparing the playstyle of how aggressive setups like this can be compared to like Heavy Threshing Sword, the difference is pretty drastic. One relies on careful positioning, whiff punishing, and timing, and straight swords just kind of hold forward and click buttons. But what's more brain dead than straight swords? If you said spinning slash, you'd be right! As I said earlier, spinning slash is ludicrous. You can apply it to a bleed or proc weapon for instant status procs if all three hit, and guaranteeing bleed damage on the proc since the last hit can't be rolled. Spinning slash was banned off of ladder, especially when used with Nagakiba, but I find it hard to argue that it's a pretty stupid Nash of War no matter what weapon that you put it on. And as you can see by these fights, there really isn't a whole lot to say other than GG. The weapon just kind of wins by itself, there's no fancy spacing or tech, it's just spin to win. You can argue, uh, bait it out or whiff punish, but let's just say it like it is, this shit's dumb. Up next is Bloody Helis, and I'll be real with you, I fought for about two hours with this thing. Every single time I used the Ash of War, the initial thrust would always hit and combo into a killing blow. I could not get any clips of the frame trap because people were dying too much. I don't know what to tell you, but for this fight, I really just said fuck it, and I just kept using the Ash of War, hoping that they'd actually roll the first hit. It's honestly not even that good of a weapon, I just think that people just aren't used to fighting it. Now, Thrusting Sword is arguably one of the strongest standalone weapons in the game. But it's not really the kind of weapon that you want to mash like a monkey with. You can just hold forward and expect good returns, but a more skilled player will play a little bit of a push and pull. If your opponent has no poise, like this one here in this case, mash away. So here we microspace that jump bar 1, whiff punish with a little poke, and maintain pressure as they panic roll away. The other hits don't land since they panic rolled after the first. They go for a fancy reverse jump and end up getting the infinite poise event, that prevents them from getting staggered, and I do one of my own, which ends up finishing the fight. Hey. But for my last opponent, they're using a weapon with hyper armor against my thrusting sword, so similar to how I played with the curved sword, I really have to respect the potential pressure of the hyper armor and try and avoid trading blows, which I do immediately, and then continue to quick buttons. I go for a roll catch and they avoid the hit with a quick step, sidestepping my attack, and I take time to fix my talismans, play around with their quick steps. Here we get them on the quick step, but I continue to aggress, thinking that the first would have poise broken, but our latency seems really high, so they were actually already in their hyper armor frames on their side of the screen. I manage to land a jumping R1, as they start to strafe past it, and it becomes a little bit more obvious just how bad the connection is. In general, I should have been playing a lot more conservatively against this opponent, only going for like one or two hits and never the third, since that always gave them an opening to land a hit on me. But it works out in the end, and we finish the fight with the trade. But that's going to do it for this video. There was a lot of information here between frame data, movesets, what to do, what not to do, and all that. So I might do more broken down videos later on, covering, say, like, one individual weapon or frame trap on its own in better detail. We really only scratched the surface here, but hopefully it provided you with some understanding of how and why some of these interactions in your fights may play out the way that they do, and how you can address in the future. Thank you all for watching, and I hope to catch you in the next one.